Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about TrueNAS and high availability storage. So, TrueNAS. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the TrueNAS M50HA. Now, they sell HA in other forms as well. The one I have in for demo that was thankfully uh, lent to me by the TrueNAS folks, the IX Systems folks, is this unit. Uh, someone asked me when I have to return it, and um, I hope never, but I there is an end date on how long I get to play with this. And we've been doing some testing with it, and I've rebuilt the arrays. And I'm really impressed with it. But that aside, I've already done videos, uh, you know, excited about the hardware. We're going to talk specifically about how the software handles failover. Because that's the reason you buy one of these HA systems. If you have something that's absolutely mission critical and you want the storage systems not to fail or mitigate any risk, and that's really what you're doing. Okay, how do we mitigate risk of, you know, hard drives go ahead? We put a RAID array in. That's easy enough. What about the motherboard that controls us going in? How do you mitigate that? Well, in the case of the TrueNAS M50 series and any of their HA ones like this, you put in two motherboards. So there are two separate units in this. Like I said, I have a separate video on all the hardware details. But what happens? How does it actually work for fail, failover and availability? All right. TrueNAS, and we're going to do a demo of it, but at least I'm going to start with an explainer here. TrueNAS High Availability Explained. They use an active passive method. So those two controllers, one on top of the other, the storage controller one, storage controller two, are both talking to physically every drive at the same time. They have total connection to them. So should the first controller fail, the second storage controller has to register with the storage matrix before it can form any I.O. And additionally, the second storage controller might not be powered on awaiting, so it has to boot up from a cold state. This is one of the problems of having like a cold controller. This is why they use it in active standby. In the active standby array, every disk is dual ported, allowing the second controller to be connected directly to each disk at all times. The second controller waits for the authority to handle IO operations. Finally, any cache that is in the first controller can be synchronized to the second controller, ensuring it does not have to be repopulated after a failover event. The end result is that a failover operation can happen in seconds rather than minutes, significantly reducing the chance of a client timeout. Matter of fact, you when you're using iSCSI, absolutely um, it's seamless. So that's what we're going to demo on this. Now, they also explain why they didn't do active active because I've had people ask, well, does it do load balancing active active because the other controller is just kind of chilling, doing nothing. And the problem with that is if you do load balance between the two of them and you have a load on the system that would exceed what any one system can handle, well, it doesn't really fail over gracefully at that point because now the IOPS goes down because you can't perform as much and your performance goes down and that may cause an application to crash or cause other issues. So in that circumstance, you really want a system that is able to be active standby. So whatever load the system can handle, the other controller, even though it's not doing anything right now, in the case of a failure, it absolutely can handle. That's an important aspect of it. So I'll leave a link to this, and this is you know a little bit more of a write-up on there. Now, um, like any lawyer who uh, asks a question in court, they always know the answer before they actually ask the question. And yes, I know the failover is going to work because I'm showing you the demo here. This is what it looks like when you fail over. We're going to do it in real time, uh, but this was running on, and I've named the, the system here, LockNAS1 and LockNAS2. So, you know, LockNAS monsters are big. All right, if I have to explain a joke, it's not funny. So this one right here, LockNAS1 and LockNAS2, was in reverse. I had already initiated a failover before I did the video to show it working, and this is kind of like the results of that. I was running a bunch of tests, and we see it ramping up of all the... Uh, data being pulled across because this one was the primary and when we switch there's a stop point of right here at 2 10 p.m and 2 10 p.m where it switches to all the io load going over to lock dash one we're going to do the same thing in reverse so the ha works using the cart method so the cart means i'm always going to 192 3.250 but these each have separate IP addresses, and the CARP address is the shared address between them. So when you're connecting everything, it connects to the CARP address. This is going to be the failover address. So when I'm setting things up, and we're going to look over here like XCPNG, i am got these set up as TrueNAS iSCSI, and the TrueNAS iSCSI is connected to 192.168.3.250. And it's very important that you do this, that you don't connect it to one of the other primary assigned IPs on the storage array. You always attach it to the CARP IP. And what that does is 
That is the IP that the two systems uh, use by which everything should connect. That way, no matter which one fails over, you always have a solid IP. That's just a little important detail about how these work. And I've done videos on PFSense using CARP. It's the same concept exactly um, being used here. This is the iSCSI extent. It's mapped right here through TrueNAS. This one's active, called Loch Ness 1. When you look here, if you mouse over, this one, port 13 is Loch Ness 2, port 14 is Loch Ness 1. They're both connected at 10 gig. And I have a couple machines running on this. So I have this uh, Debian in TrueNAS, and then I got this Windows on TrueNAS. And for Windows, why not make it fun? What's the most dangerous thing you can think to do uh, losing an array is rebooting or unplugging a Windows machine while it's doing an update. It just, Windows doesn't survive well if it's doing an update and uh, you restart it or lose the storage controller. So we're going to kick this off. Then I'll kick this off too. Why not uh, run some tests on here? So we'll just uh, make it a little bit more taxing. Nine iterations, hit all. There we go. We are just going to massively keep this drive really busy, doing high numbers of reads, writes while it's doing an update. So IO activity is absolutely, you know, it, it's going. It's a lot happening right here. And on top of that off, why not go over here? And, uh, well, let's SSH into this one. So let's say IP address is going to be 3.142. Sh root at all right so uh let's make this do something i think i got the pharaonics test suite on here there we go it's gonna run a little slow because we're loading it up on iops on the other side we're hammering this thing right now so i'll let that go and we'll just say uh four five three there we go uh nope don't care about saving results now it's going to go hammer down and create a bunch of disk IO. Go back over here to storage. Look at true NAS iSCSI, look at the stats. And here we go. We're eh, about 500 megs a second right now in transfers based on all the little read writes on there and uh, 50,000 plus IOPS. It's still going up 54,000 IOPS. So you could say the storage controller is quite busy right now. Definitely load it up. So let's go back over here to true NAS. Yep, and we definitely see some processor load, and it's not killing it, but it's um, it's doing some stuff now. We see 18 gigs committed to cache. We'll keep seeing this get bigger and bigger because it's going to cache some of those read-write operations that are going on. So uh, this thing's just hammering away doing exactly what we want it to do. So it's going, and if we go over here to Unify, we'll go ahead and refresh this. It'll take a second to catch up with the stats, and but Unify will start showing all these stats and going, yep, we'll see all these transfers going between these uh, devices. So fresh again. All right, there we go. So we can see the um, the i7 system pulling a lot of data. We can see Loch Ness 2 sitting here doing nothing because all the data is going to Loch Ness 1. Loch Ness 1 is the primary right now, as you can see. So this is the primary. And what port is that plugged into? See, that is plugged into port 14 is Loch Ness 1 and port 13 is here. So what we're going to do in Windows, it should still be running its updates over here. Oh, look, we're getting some hard drive numbers uh, pending restart. So we won't, well, I guess we could, we're going to go ahead and let this run, that run, tell Windows to restart. And, uh, well, well, actually, we'll just keep letting this continue to run, and then we'll restart Windows as soon as I go pull the plug. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run in the other room just real quick and yank the plug out because that seems like the most devastating way. I could just tell it to disconnect right here, um, which would be an unexpected, but, you know, why not just physically pull the plug out. So we're going to pull out plug 14. Uh, you'll see it go dark here when it refreshes. And then we're going to have restart windows as soon as I pull it out. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to do it all as one operation. This is running. We're going to hit restart, pull it out, and let's just see if uh, we lose any data. All right, cable unplugged. And windows is still updating. And then just for proof, Right here, TrueNAS iSCSI, this is where the uh, data lives for that particular system. We're still running Windows Update. We'll let it keep doing its thing here. We'll switch over to the other system. Yep, it's still running over here. We didn't miss a beat on this one. This is uh, the lab machine still doing its thing. Actually, we should get an error over here, though. So let's refresh the page, and it should... Checking HA status, waiting for one of the controllers. Now, you do lose for a moment while it does the checking, 
and we switched over to the other theme. Your session ID was logged into the first one. So now we just have to log in again over here. And we should get a, yeah, alert. Yes, warning. <laughs> Loch Ness 2 is head of a failover event. And we see Loch Ness 2 is now the uh, system in charge. But once again, everything's working. HA is disabled because it can't even find the other system. So it'll give you an HA disabled uh, error. And once we plug it back in, it'll go ahead and come back. So we'll let it keep doing its thing and we'll let Windows keep doing its thing here. I go to here, Windows. Oh, yeah, Windows is not rebooting because of any other reason, because it's finishing loading updates. You can see it didn't actually shut down or die. Back over here. This one, machine's still up and running. Still responding. Obviously, if the hard drive was broke, it wouldn't respond. Uptime. Didn't reboot, so been up for 14 minutes. We started it when we started this video here. Windows is still running its update, so... Oh, and Windows appears to be back up and running. And in the background... No... Nothing went wrong here. We're still just running tests in the background, running heavy I.O. loads. System still loaded up just like it was over here. Windows restarting again because, you know, updates require multiple restarts for reasons that I don't completely understand compared to Linux, but I'm not here to harp on Windows. <laughs> and uh, everything's up and running. This is as simple as that for the failover. Now let's see, we'll give the, the Unify takes a little bit more time to refresh these stats. So you're going to see a gap and then it's going to pull the data and we'll have another gap here. But what you're going to see is it go flat on one and then locked as two because that's what's primary now. This one here, all those IO ops are still happening in the background. So they will just move over to the other system. And I'm actually going to stop real quick and plug back in the other system just so it's plugged in. and It'll catch up and I'll show you how they resync to each other and ready for the failover event to happen again. Windows still booting? Yeah, Windows is still doing its magic. All right, and the system's all back up. All I did was plug it back in because it wasn't actually a hardware, hardware failure, but it was, you know, the simulated because we lost connectivity on there. It switched to the other one. Now, ideally, if you're setting this up in HA, you're going to have redundant switches. One plugged into one switch. Everything's going to be paired. The other system plugged into the other switch. That way there's, if a switch failure or a cable failure or whichever failure you're dealing with, um, you mitigate the risk dramatically by able to do that. Um, this is pretty basic because all I have it only tied into one 10 gig switch, but you get the idea for high availability that it works seamlessly, that this is still running in the background and we didn't lose anything by switching between there. We were running Windows Update. We disconnected the storage controller that Windows was running on and still didn't lose any data and Windows didn't crash, which is risky just in general doing updates. All right, I'll stop picking on Windows. The important thing is, with these high abilities, with this active standby, um, it's very robustly reliable. But someone will always ask me, what about, can't I just store things with, let's say, Ceph or Gluster or many of the other distributed file systems out there that allow you to take physical servers, so to speak, and create them as a RAID array? Yes, that does work. The problem you run into, and it's not a problem that's not solvable, it's a problem that gets expensive to solve. Because the TrueNAS system works with dual controllers and the switching fabric is right down to the level of talking to both hard drives and then synchronizing at that speed between the controllers, you have this instant failover and you can have excellent speed. When you talk about tying something together with a distributed file system, cluster stuff, just as examples, um, you talk about rating essentially like a RAID between physically separate servers, but you can never synchronize the file system for full HA any faster than the network interconnect between them. So the problem becomes building an interconnect fast enough to handle the load between servers. So if one server were to fail in your cluster of servers, then you have to have that data immediately available. So those are other ways of handling this. Uh, TrueNAS is really good at handling the scenario that we had set up right here. You could build it into something else and use one of these other things on top of it. But for a true, you want to put it in there and you have your virtualization stack connected with iSCSI and have redundancy in the entire stack. So you can instantly fail over from a controller or a switch failure where they're dual plugged in and everything else. This will handle that flawlessly at very, very high speeds. So we get excellent read-write performance. We have 
excellent reliability right here. And so this is the scenario that you're building out with this. Like I said, it's not the only solution, but when you think about the other solutions, those are some of the challenges you come into of building multiple fast servers and being able to synchronize the file system between there because the TrueNAS system is actually attached to each drive at the same time there isn't any delay and failover and all the writes are happening always to the same hard drives. So the two systems are talking to the same drives, hence the reason this works so well and so fast. And just to refresh the Unify here, you see we're still hammering now on LockNAS2 because it's primary and LockNAS1 is now the backup one. So there's really not any data. There's just some really basic couple kilobytes because it's talking to that same 250 address and confirming that it's still there. If it loses connection to it, like when you just yank the plug out, it immediately initiates the failover and becomes master again. And we can, you know, flip these back and forth. Uh, so Loctus 2 is primary, Loctus 1 is secondary. And like I said, the cycle continues by unplugging, plugging back and forth. So hopefully this clears up a little bit of how the HA system works on TrueNAS and how it survives a failure of a, well, you can fail over the entire motherboard itself. You can fail over just by unplugging the network. But either way, when it loses communication, it immediately with a nice SCSI connection without dropping anything can switch over and work perfectly fine in terms of not losing any data and maintaining so the users don't know what happened. And that's the idea of any of this system is you should be able to survive, you know, different pieces of failure, whether it's a drive or an entire part of your uh, system right here, you should be able to survive failure and the users keep on working because when you're doing your job right, they don't know you're doing your job. It's, it's sometimes thankless, but it's also really a smile on my face to say, hey, it failed. Uh, we got the alert that it failed, but nobody had to stop working. And that's the important part. All right. Thanks.